Welcome to Guideline Central. My name is Dr. Tabitha Michaud, and today we'll be discussing the Infectious Disease Society of America, or IDSA's, 2019 guidelines titled The Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Management of Asymptomatic Bacteria, published March 2019 in the Clinical Infectious Diseases Journal. The purpose of this guideline is to provide evidence-based guidance on the screening and treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, or ASB, in populations where ASB has been identified as common or potentially detrimental. And this guideline is intended for all healthcare professionals taking care of patients who may develop an ASB, including general internists, primary healthcare providers, pediatricians, and OBGYNs. Now this guideline is actually an update to the 2005 IDSA guidelines and includes recommendations for populations not previously addressed, such as children and patients with solid organ transplants. This guideline also provides interpretations of non-localizing clinical symptoms in populations with a high prevalence of ASB, such as those with a spinal cord injury or adults over the age of 65. However, this guideline does not discuss recommendations for candidurea, but you can find those recommendations in the Management of Candidiasis Guidelines, also published by IDSA, available on our website at guidelinecentral.com. Now, the recommendations for this guideline were developed with a 15-person multidisciplinary panel, all with experience relevant to ASB, and this panel developed and assessed their guideline recommendations using the GRADE method, and that means for each of these recommendations, there will be both a strength of recommendation grading of either strong or weaker conditional, and there will also be a quality of evidence grading as high, moderate, low, or very low. Now, before we get into the recommendations, the IDSA does include a couple of key points that we want to make sure to bring up too, starting with the definition of an asymptomatic bacteria. And for that, the definition of ASB is defined as, for patients without an indwelling catheter, the presence of one or more species of bacteria growing in the urine at a quantity of greater than 10 to the fifth CFUs per milliliter or greater than 10 to the eighth CFUs per liter in avoided urine specimen without signs or symptoms attributable to a UTI. The IDSA also includes that for women, two consecutive specimens should be obtained, preferably within two weeks, to confirm the persistence of a bacteria. For 10 to 60% of women, depending on the population, they do not have a persistent bacteria on repeat screening after an initial positive. For men, a single urine specimen, meeting these quantitative criteria, is sufficient for a diagnosis. Also, observational and intervention studies evaluating the long-term screening and treatment in school children and healthy women suggest that ASB is benign in children and in women who are not pregnant. In addition, efforts to maintain sterile urine were often futile. The IDSA also includes that screening for and treatment of ASB is only recommended for pregnant women and prior to endourological procedures. And the last key point is that studies in other populations suggest that antimicrobial treatment does not confer any benefits, but it does increase the risk of adverse outcomes, including antimicrobial resistance and C. diff infection. In some cases, the risk of UTI shortly following therapy may be increased. Now we're gonna go through these recommendations in our quick reference format. So starting with the management for asymptomatic bacteria in special patient populations, our first recommendation from the IDSA is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here for infants and children, the IDSA recommends against the screening or treatment for an ASB. For this recommendation, the IDSA does include a remark that there is low quality evidence that there is no benefit and high quality evidence of harm. Our next recommendation for the special patient populations is gonna be for patients who are healthy premenopausal women, healthy postmenopausal women, and non-pregnant women. And for these patient populations, the IDSA recommends against the screening or treatment for ASB, and this is a strong recommendation with a moderate quality of evidence. Our next recommendation from the IDSA is the special patient population of pregnant women. And for this population, the IDSA does recommend for the screening and treating of ASBs. The IDSA does include a remark for this recommendation that a recent study in the Netherlands suggested that non-treatment of ASB may be an acceptable option for selected low-risk women. 
However, the committee felt that further evaluation in other populations was necessary to confirm the generalizability of this observation. The IDSA does suggest a urine culture collected at one of the initial visits early in the pregnancy. There is insufficient evidence to inform a recommendation for repeat screening during the pregnancy for women with an initial negative screening culture or following the treatment of initial episodes of ASB. The next recommendation from the IDSA is a weak recommendation with a low quality of evidence, and this recommendation is also for pregnant women. And here, the IDSA recommends treating with an antimicrobial therapy for four to seven days rather than for a shorter duration. The IDSA does include a remark that the optimal duration of therapy will vary depending on the antimicrobial given. The shortest effective course should be used. Our next recommendation from the IDSA is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA recommends that for older community-dwelling patients who are functionally impaired, they recommend against the screening or treating of ASBs. Our next recommendation is for older persons resident in long-term care facilities. And for these patients, the IDSA recommends against the screening or treating of ASBs. And this is a strong recommendation with a moderate quality of evidence. The IDSA does include a remark for this recommendation, though, that there is moderate quality evidence that there is no benefit and high quality evidence of harm. Our next few recommendations from the IDSA will be for patient populations with comorbidities. So our first recommendation is a strong recommendation with a very low certainty of evidence, and here the IDSA recommends that. In older patients with functional or cognitive impairment and with bacteria and delirium, and without local genitourinary symptoms or other systemic signs of infection, the IDSA recommends for the assessment for other causes and careful observation rather than antimicrobial treatment of a bacteria. Our next recommendation from the IDSA for our patient populations with comorbidities is a strong recommendation with a very low quality of evidence, and here the IDSA recommends that in older patients with functional and or cognitive impairment with a bacteria and without local genitourinary symptoms or other systemic signs of infection who experience a fall, the IDSA recommends assessment for other causes and careful observation rather than antimicrobial treatment of a bacteria. The IDSA does include a comment on the values and preferences considerations. And for this recommendation, it does place a high value on avoiding adverse outcomes of antimicrobial therapy, such as C. diff infection or increased antimicrobial resistance in the absence of evidence that such a treatment is beneficial for this vulnerable population. They also include the remark that in bacteria patients with fever or other systemic signs, potentially consistent with a severe infection or sepsis and without a localizing source, Broad-spectrum antimicrobial therapy directed against urinary and non-urinary sources should be initiated. Our next recommendation from the IDSA for patients with comorbidities is a strong recommendation with a moderate quality of evidence. And here, for patients with diabetes, the IDSA recommends against screening or treating ASBs. The IDSA does include a remark that this recommendation for the non-treatment of men is inferred from observations and studies that have primarily enrolled women. Our next recommendation from the IDSA for managing ASBs in patients with comorbidities is a strong recommendation with a high quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA recommends that for patients who are renal transplant recipients who had their renal transplantation surgery more than one month prior, the IDSA recommends against the screening or treating of ASBs. The IDSA includes a remark for this recommendation that there is insufficient evidence to inform a recommendation for or against the screening or treatment of ASB within the first month following a renal transplantation. For patients with non-renal solid organ transplants, the IDSA recommends against the screening or treating of an ASB, and this is also a strong recommendation with a moderate quality of evidence. For this recommendation, the IDSA does include a comment on values and preferences, and for this recommendation places a high value on the avoidance of antimicrobial use so as to limit the acquisition of antimicrobial resistant organisms or C. diff infection in solid organ transplant patients who are at increased risk for these adverse outcomes. They also include the remark that in non-renal solid organ transplant recipients, symptomatic UTIs are uncommon, 
and the adverse consequences of symptomatic UTIs are extremely rare. The risk of complications from ASB is therefore probably negligible. Our next recommendation is for patients who are at high risk for neutropenia, which is cell counts of less than 100 for a duration of greater than seven days following chemotherapy. And for this patient population, the IDSA does not make a recommendation for or against the treating or screening of ASBs due to a knowledge gap. The IDSA does include the remark that for patients with high risk for neutropenia, they should be managed with prophylactic antimicrobial therapy and prompt initiation of antimicrobial therapy when a febrile illness occurs. It is unclear how frequently ASB occurs and how often it progresses to symptomatic infection. Patients with low risk for neutropenia have only a very small risk of infection, and there is no evidence to suggest that in this population, ASB has greater risk than for non-neutropenic populations. And the last recommendation in our patient populations with comorbidities recommendations is a recommendation against the screening or treating of ASBs in patients with a spinal cord injury, or SCI. This was a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. The IDSA does include a remark for this recommendation that the clinical signs and symptoms of a UTI experienced by patients with SCI may differ from the classic genitourinary symptoms experienced by patients with normal sensation. The atypical presentations of UTI in these patients should be considered in making decisions with respect to the treatment or non-treatment of bacteria. Our next few management recommendations will be for patient populations with catheters. And our first recommendation is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA recommends against screening or treating ASBs in patients with short-term indwelling urethral catheters. The IDSA does include a remark for this recommendation that considerations are likely to be similar for patients with indwelling suprapubic catheters and it is reasonable to manage these patients similar to patients with indwelling urethral catheters. For our next recommendation, for patients with indwelling catheters, the IDSA does not make a recommendation for or against treating or screening for ASBs at the time of catheter removal. This recommendation has no recommendation grading due to a knowledge gap. For this recommendation, the IDSA includes the remark that Antimicrobial prophylaxis given at the time of catheter removal may confer a benefit for prevention of symptomatic UTIs for some patients. The evidence to support this observation is largely from studies enrolling surgical patients who received prophylactic antimicrobials at the time of short-term catheter removal, generally without screening to determine if an ASB is present. It is unclear whether or not the benefit is greater in patients with an ASB. And our last management recommendation for patients with catheters is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA recommends against screening or treating patients for an ASB if they have a long-term indwelling catheter. Our next few recommendations from the IDSA are gonna be for surgical patient populations. And our first recommendation for this group is a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA recommends against screening or treating for ASBs in patients undergoing elective non-urological surgeries. Our next recommendation for surgical patient populations is for patients who are undergoing endoscopic urological procedures associated with mucosal trauma. For this patient population, the IDSA does recommend screening and treating ASBs prior to surgery. This was a strong recommendation with a moderate quality of evidence. For this recommendation, the IDSA does include a comment on values and preferences. And for this recommendation, places a high value on the avoidance of the serious postoperative complication of sepsis, which is a substantial risk for patients undergoing invasive endourological procedures in the presence of a bacteria. They also include the remark that in individuals with bacteria, these are procedures in a heavily contaminated surgical field. High quality evidence from other surgical procedures shows that perioperative antimicrobial treatment or prophylaxis for contaminated or clean contaminated procedures confers important benefits. Our next recommendation from the IDSA is a weak recommendation with a very low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA suggests that a urine culture be obtained prior to the procedure for patients undergoing endoscopic urological procedures and that targeted antimicrobial therapy be prescribed rather than empiric therapy.
Our next recommendation is a weak recommendation with a low quality of evidence. And here, the IDSA suggests that for patients with an ASB undergoing a urological procedure, that these patients be treated with a short course of one or two doses rather than prolonged antimicrobial therapy. The IDSA does include a remark for this recommendation that antimicrobial therapy should be initiated 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. And for our last recommendation in the surgical patient population section, the IDSA gave a weak recommendation with a very low quality of evidence. And here they recommend against screening or treating ASBs in patients undergoing surgery for an artificial urine sphincter or a penile prosthesis implantation. The IDSA does include the remark for this recommendation that all patients should receive standard perioperative antimicrobial prophylaxis prior to device implantation. And our last recommendation from the IDSA on the management of asymptomatic bacteria is for patient populations with devices. And for this recommendation, the IDSA gave a weak recommendation with a very low quality of evidence. And here they recommend against screening or treating for ASBs in patients living with implanted urological devices. And that wraps up the IDSA's management of asymptomatic bacteria guidelines and the 14 recommendations by patient population. Now, if you're looking for more information about this guideline or these recommendations, you can find both the pocket guide and the link to the full text guideline on our website at guidelinecentral.com. While you're there, make sure to check out our library of hundreds of clinical practice guidelines and quick reference content from over 45 different medical societies. And we'll see you guys on the next guideline.